Good evening, and welcome to the Graduate Center. I'm Gary Giddens, the Executive Director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, which was created six years ago with a generous grant from Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation. Our goal is to further the study and high standards of life writing. We are now, uh, f and for the next month, accepting applications for our fellowship program. So if there are any emerging biographers here, or if you know of any, please uh, see Michael Gately uh, uh, tonight or contact him at, uh, here at the, uh, at the Graduate Center. Uh, you have a month to bring in applications. Uh, we have events that are always open and free to the public, usually one or two a month. And I want to alert you to the next one, which is Friday night at 7 uh, p.m. when Raquel Chang Rodriguez, a distinguished professor of Hispanic literature at the Graduate Center, will interview Maria Rana about her stunning new biography of Bolivar. And then on December 11th, also at 7, the distinguished arts writer Judith Dobrinsky will talk to Deborah Solomon about American Mirror, the life and art of Norman Rockwell. Both of those are in the skylight room upstairs. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome Scott Anderson, a novelist, journalist, historian, biographer, whose own life might have been the stuff of a Graham Greene novel. Raised primarily in Taiwan and Korea, where his father served as agricultural advisor for the United States government, he came to journalism relatively late in life, in his middle 30s, with a report on Belfast based on his exclusive contacts with members of the IRA. The piece was a great success, and he once told an interviewer, I found that by going to war zones or where bad stuff is happening, I could get people to pay me to do it. It seemed pretty cool. <laughs> For the past 20 years, he has covered wars on five continents, including much of the territory discussed in Lawrence and Arabia. His accounts have appeared in the New York Times, Vanity Fair, Harper's Esquire, Gentleman's Quarterly, and many other publications. His reporting on Bosnia was adapted for the feature film, The Hunting Party, and his first novel, Triage, about a photojournalist suffering the effects of trauma from his time in Iraqi Kurdistan, appeared in 1998 and was also made into a film. His second novel, Moonlight Hotel, appeared in 2006. His works of nonfiction include The Man Who Tried to Save the World, The Four O'Clock Murders, and two volumes written with his brother, John Lee Anderson, Inside the League and War Zones. A few months ago, he brought out one of the most remarkable and really astonishing studies of World War I to appear in many years, focusing on the Arab revolt, the betrayal of the Middle East, and that ever enigmatic figure, T.E. Lawrence. If you haven't read Lawrence in Arabia, I suggest you buy a copy tonight and then book a week at a peaceful resort because once you start reading it, you won't want to do anything else. Please welcome Scott Anderson. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> it occurred to me reading this, because I read a lot of espionage literature, that uh, Eric Ambler and John Le Carre could not have gotten away <laughs> with half as much idiocy, betrayal, <laughs> treachery, spy versus spy versus spy, bloodlust. Uh, I mean, every page just makes you sort of shake your head. And some of it, I think, w whether uh, deliberately or not, becomes funny. Right. Because of the in just unbelievable incompetence. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's was, really was true. This, tell me what attracted you to the subject in the first place. Well, I, I've spent a lot of time covering war. It, it, I've, it inevitably means in the modern era you spend a lot of time in the Middle East. And w what I discovered very quickly was that it, when you had any serious discussion with, with somebody in that region, no matter their po political background or secular background, um, invariably they traced the problems in the region back to the, the peace that was created at the end of World War I and the, and the, and the way the region was carved up uh, be primarily between the British and the French. So it was always in my mind to, to really understand what was happening there today. I, I wanted to go back to that time. And what, what made it also very attractive was I knew that T.E. Lawrence um, was, a, was a very pivotal figure in that, uh, in that whole story. Um, 
he, I, I'd seen the movie Lawrence of Arabia as a kid. And, um, Not I, since? I'll, you know, the whole time I was writing the book, I didn't see it. I saw it again uh, about two months ago uh, for the first time it, over the whole course of this book. And it really stands up. It's, it's just a terrific movie. And I, I, think that, I think the reason that movie is still a classic is that it gets something of, of the, the kind of Shakespearean tragic figure that Lawrence was. And, um, and so finally, after uh, about five years ago, I decided I, I was, ha had had enough of war. Probably coincided with the birth of my daughter, uh, my first child. And uh, so I thought, you know, it'd be, great, it'd be a great time to just to, to get off the streets for a while and, mm -hmm. and, and really you know, dig into a big project. So. The, one of the things that makes the book so e extraordinary and unusual is that you have this large dramatis persona. Uh, Lawrence is the central figure, but there are amazing people circulating around it. And I want to talk specifically about them as, as we progress in the conversation. But I'm, I'm curious as to how you elected these particular people. And then once you had them, you were required to do the research that would go into five or six or seven biographies. And did you at some time just say, why, why am I doing this? Well, it, it's funny you say that because rich, there's now, Lawrence is the central character. And then I have three three secondary, large secondary characters. At one time, there was going to be seven. <laughs> well, only if you don't include Jamal. Right, and, it, right. And Mark Sykes. That's right, and, and, the, and the French colonel who was. Um, um, well, I, I, when I was contemplating how to, to write about Lawrence, um, because there have been something 70, 80 biographies done on him over the years, just, uh, just to, you know, what could I say that was different from what everyone, everyone else had? And I had this. A, a kind of epiphany where, I, and I was going back to looking at the central riddle of Lawrence, which was essentially how did he do it? How did a 28-year-old Oxford scholar without a single day of military training, how did that guy go off to Arabia and become the, the battlefield commander of, of a rebel army? Not just a rebel army, but a, a Muslim rebel army. And it occurred to me, of course, part of the answer is, is just a touch of genius. Um, um, the right man being in the right place at the right time. But, it, but another factor was that no one was really paying much attention. This was in the midst of World War I. Certainly, you know, the vast majority of British and French blood and treasure was being expended on the Western Front. So this kind of eccentric guy could go off to Arabia and cause problems for the, for the Turkish enemy. Um, well, go do it. And wh when, I, when it occurred to me that that was, a, that, that was important to Lawrence's story, I got thinking, well, if that was true about the British, who were by far the biggest imperial player in the region, then it must have been true about the other warring parties also. And so I, I started to, to look around for other people. Um, and really how I came to the, people I, the secondary people I focus on, a, a German uh, Oriental scholar who, who became the head of German counterintelligence in the region and a, an American intelligence agent as they, they were the only games in town. They, it, there was literally one American field intelligence officer in the entire Middle East during World War I, and, and his name was William Yale. No one's ever heard of him, but he was it. Um, so it, it, there really wasn't a large pool to, to work from once I, got, once I got looking at it. I mean, just on the basis of what you said, I, just to give a sense of how crazy this whole thing is, uh, the, the German is Karl Prufer or Prof? Prufer, Prufer, yeah. Prufer. Prufer. Uh, one of whose mistresses, he's a proto-Nazi who will become very much involved with Hitler, and one of his mistresses is Chaim Weizmann's sister. Right, whom, that's whom right. he convinces <laughs> to spy for Germany. That's right. He, he, uh, he, 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 was, he's a, Prufer is a fascinating figure. One of the details I just love about Prufer, and, and it's, it's one of these things you couldn't put in a novel, because he, did become, he went on to become the Nazi, uh, the German ambassador to Brazil. Uh, he was very high up in the, in, the, in the Nazi regime. And he was a very scary figure, even though he's very slight. Um, and it, when he was operating in Syria, he, he, he would kick in doors and haul people off to be executed or deported. But he'd had, this, uh, he'd had a throat operation he had, um, as a kid mm -hmm. that left his voice. It, it was, his voice was always described as this feathery whisper. And I just think of the idea of a, of a, a counterintelligence guy kicking in your door to haul you off, and he's talking in a little whisper. You know, it's just like, <laughs> this is kind of too perfect, yeah. Uh, but he, but, and so he, he operated a spy ring, and he came up with this very clever idea, because he was in Syria, 
the British were in Egypt, and that was their, their military headquarters for the campaign in the Middle East. And uh, a lot of Jews, who Jewish settlers in Palestine, were, were leaving. They're either being uh, deported or, or being allowed to leave voluntarily. And he got the idea that if he recruited Jewish spies, um, and they, they could go to, to Cairo and they could, they could spy on what the British were up to. So one of his first recruits was, her name was Minna Weitzman, um, uh, who was Heim Weitzman's younger, younger sister. And uh, she went, very beautiful, and she, she got caught very quickly, and, but, she, but this great sort of you know, old world chivalry, is, it's like they, they basically, she was caught red-handed, um, but it was, this kind of attitude was, well, no one that beautiful could, could do something evil. <laughs> so she was kind of let go, and she survived the war. She was deported back to Russia, where the family was originally from. She survived, and she ended up going back, um, back to Israel. Interestingly, Chaim Weitzman is a 700-page biography. No mention of Minna anywhere in it. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Even though she ended up working for Hadassah. That's right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then there's William Yale, who uh, just makes me laugh to think of. Uh, here's a guy who is sent over by Standard Oil to pretend to be an American playboy looking right. for drops of oil in the sand. Right. Convinces Jamal Pasha, the governor of Syria, to give him millions of acres of land, and then doesn't seem to mind that they never actually drill. Right, that's right, that's right. So what, basically, what William Yale did, and he has a he has a really interesting backstory. He is of the Yale family, of Yale University, and uh, this this incredibly you know Yankee blue blood family, uh, aristocratic family, and when he was a freshman, it, it, so he grew up in incredible wealth. He, he, uh, the family estate was a four-acre estate um, in, in uh, uh, Spite and Dibel, the area right up at the top of Manhattan, four acres. Um, and so an incredibly privileged life. His father got wiped out in the panic of 1907, the Wall Street panic. So in one year, Yale went from being one of the wealthiest young men, he was 19, 20, um, one of the wealthiest young men in America. The next summer, he was working on the Panama Canal, uh, as a roustabout. Yeah, <laughs> so he had to make his own way. He goes to, he goes to um, Syria for Standard Oil. And yes, and so his job, and it, you know, again, the Americans don't come into the war until 1917. So for the first three years of World War I, Yale is living in Jerusalem, watching over a million acres of, that Standard Oil has concessions on. And yes, not, not drilling at all. They're, and Standard Oil's whole idea, they wanted to do grab up as much of the, of the region as they could, and they were gonna wait till after the war to, to go in, so. Yeah, it struck me that uh, the attitude of Standard Oil during the war is very similar to that of France, <laughs> right. which is that they're not even really focused on what's going on, and in fact, France is constantly undermining its so-called ally, Britain, right. because they're all plotting about how they're going to get control of the land afterwards. afterwards. Yeah, and, and it's, it's amazing. I mean, it comes up again and again. The British and, and, the, and the French and then the Russians before the, the Bolsheviks took over, they were, they were in alliance with Britain and France. They're constantly having these conferences where they're dividing up, especially the Middle East, and, and at a time when, if they're not losing the war, they're certainly not winning it. And they did this all through the war. And, and there were times when they, would, it def, they definitely appear to be on the losing side, and yet they're squabbling about what's coming afterwards and what they're going to grab. Well, one instance that you go into in some detail is, and the, the first time you really begin to realize Lawrence's tactical genius, is that he realizes that there is a very weak Achilles heel at Alexandrietta. Right. And the French don't want Britain to attack there because they're, they're going to own Syria. They don't want British boots there. That's right. And so they go to, as you say in the book, if you look at the map, what's the, the worst place to go in? Gallipoli. Gallipoli. They, that's right. And, and Lawrence, among, other, among other British military people in Cairo, argued strenu strenuously for landing in Alexandria, which is, if you, can, if you imagine the, it's, it's kind of where the long coastline of Israel, Lebanon, Syria, then there's the kind of crook right there where Turkey begins, and it's that, right in that crook. And if they'd, put a, if they'd landed there, 
they would have basically cut the Ottoman Empire in half because the only road and the only railway that connected Turkey to everything south was right there in Alexandretta. Um, and as you said, the French vetoed, again and again vetoed the plan. So to figure out where else to go, they decide on Gallipoli. So they landed at, this, at the very tip of this narrow peninsula, mountainous, um, and suffered a, a quarter of a million casualties in, in eight months. Um, it's, it's a just massacre. A it's just yeah. an absolute wipeout, and they don't leave. Right. They just keep sending more bodies. Yeah. Churchill was the one who, I guess, really Churchill paid. Got, he, it was, Gallipoli was kind of his idea, and, he, and so Churchill, he was the, the um, first admiral. Uh, he was the head of the, of the Navy. At, um, and uh, so he, he went into a long period of eclipse. Um, and Churchill, uh, he, he's quite peripheral to my book, but it's amazing that, to, that even in, bef even in like 1910, uh, 1910, everyone was pegging Churchill as a, as a future prime minister. And he, he really, his reputation was very much tarnished by Gallipoli, and he went into mm -hmm. eclipse for the next 30 years until right. World War II. Interestingly, one of the few uh, high figures in the British government who seems to have admired Lawrence almost without reservation, at least in his That's right. yeah. eulogy. That's right, yep. Yeah, he, he called... Uh, he called Lawrence you know, one of the most remarkable men he'd, he'd ever met and ever seen. So, uh, Another amazing figure that I think uh, it's surprising how little he's known, especially in Zionist circles, is Aaron Aronson. Right. A brilliant agronomist, extremely short-tempered. Right, <laughs> fiery temper. Who everybody ends up despising. Right. <laughs> runs a spy network believes he can take over, create a, a, a Jewish state, not through politics, but by inventing, finding plant life right. that will feed the Jews that he will get to come. That's right. That's right. And yeah, it, um, it's, it had several run-ins with Lawrence where they almost came to blows. It, 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 and Weitzman also. And Weitzman also, yeah. And, um, and I, I mean, Aronson's story is quite sad. He set up this spy ring. He was in Cairo. Um, he had, he'd, gotten out, um, and he left his sister, Sarah, behind to, to run this, this spy ring inside Palestine, and it, which consisted of about two dozen uh, Jewish settlers who were, who were gathering information and then pa passing it to the British. Um, and the spy ring eventually gets uncovered, um, and Sarah Aronson is tortured, ends up, ends up shooting herself to, to get that, the torture to that's stop. That's actually one of the most dramatic moments in the book, and I, I wanted to ask you, it, just to give a little more detail, she's horribly tortured. Right. And then she convinces them to let her change and I guess shower before they... Before they take her to the main torture center. And, and she, she's got a gun hidden away and she shoots herself. herself. And the awful thing is doesn't die right 27. away. 27. She's 27, and, and yeah, 27 years old. And, and then lingered for four days, I believe. I mean, you know, died in, in real agony. Um, and then Aronson uh, teamed up with Weitzman, who's operating out of London. Um, very instrumental in, in getting the Balfour Declaration um, uh, enacted by the British in 1917. And he, but Aronson, because he's such a combative figure, he's constantly shunted to the side, by, especially by Weitzman. Um, and, but he's at the Paris Peace Conference, and again, Weitzman is trying to marginalize him. And, uh, and Aronson ends up dying in a plane crash going across the English Channel. And it's really largely written out of, and it's, it's funny, I mentioned Weitzman never mentioned his his daughter, uh, his sister, Minna, in, the, in the, his, his autobiography. He, he talks about White, uh, Aronson in uh, two sentences uh, in a 700-page book. And Aronson was really, really instrumental in the early Zionist history. The, the one uh, moment where he really uh, is uh, morally culpable is when he starts the slander against Jamal Pasha for a kind of genocidal attacks on the Jews in Jaffa, when in right. fact, Jamal goes out of his way to be yeah. kind and, and helpful to them. That's right. It, it was, it, um, yeah, Jamal Pasha is a, a fascinating figure. He was the governor general of, of Syria, um, and one of the young Turks. One of the, there were three, it was called the triumvirate, the, 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 the three Pashas who basically ran the Ottoman Empire. The young Turks. The young Turks. And, um, just a really fascinating figure, and uh, yeah, he basically was slandered. In, in, the, the story was spread by the British that 
this was a, a year after the Armenian massacres or, or genocide, and so now um, he had evacuated Jaffa because it was right near the front lines. Every, everybody had to leave Jaffa, um, but the story was spread that the, the Jews were being taken off to be, the same thing that happened to the Armenians was now gonna happen to the Jews. So it had this hugely incendiary effect around the world. Among American the newspapers immediately yep. pick it up. Yep, and, um, and so it became no, kind of No the, checking. No checking, no fact checking, even, even back then, just like, just like today. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, came, it was kind of the Ur myth of, of why, why Jews or why, why Jews or Christians could not live under, under Muslim control. I mean, it be, it, and it became, that beca just became part of this you know, so-called fact. Um, and yet, yet for 400 years the, under the Ottoman Empire, Christians were almost a majority of, of the population and, and were able to practice their religion without any problem, Jews also. The, um, I, I noticed that, uh, it, looking at some other works in this period, that when Aronson's plane went down, I guess it was over the channel, mm -hmm. yep. um, at the time there were accusations that it might have been There, there have always been theories that, it, that he might have been assassinated. Um, I, I, I looked into it and really saw no reason to think that was true. You know, planes, planes back then had this habit of just dropping out of the sky all the time. Uh, and plane, it, I, 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 I remember seeing a statistic that there was one fatality for every thousand miles in, in airplanes at that time. So um, they flew off into a storm and... Well, so he didn't crashed. go on the assigned plane. He was basically right. a pickup that's right. For a pilot. He, he hopped on a, a plane, that, and that's the reason why the assassination is very unlikely, because at the last minute he got on a plane he wasn't, he wasn't but, meant to be But on. the rumor is another instance of the paranoia. That's, that's right. That's right. It, what, it's fascinating to me that Aronson, who kept a, a, a copious diary, apparently, yep. you, which you quoted liberally, uh, quote, quote from, uh, clearly believes that uh, everybody else is an idiot. Right. Right, and, they, and, and most of them were. <laughs> right, and, and Lawrence believes everybody. Right. I mean, you have a wonderful line about Lawrence saying that uh, the British government clearly doesn't know what's, what they should be doing, and uh, I don't have the time to explain it to them. Right, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Lawrence was not a humble guy <laughs> by any means. There is no humility in this no. book. No, but for many of them, yeah. But before we uh, go away from the Aaronsons, I was wondering, has anybody ever attempted a biography of the sister? Not of the sister, no, not of the sister. There that has been. She a, is the a really heroic. Really, really fascinating figure, yeah, and, and, and really very tragic. And she was, the, the, the fascinating thing with her is that she was, she was very, very beautiful, and, but really dynamic, a really dynamic, very forceful personality. And this is, you know, the, the Jewish settlements in Palestine at the time women were very demure, they stayed in the house, and, and Sarah, Sarah Aronson scandalized the, the town she was living in because she would ride horseback, she would go hunting up in the hills with the men. And this, is, this is things that women just didn't do at that time. Um, and she really was, the, men were incredibly smitten by her, so a lot of the spies in the, in the spy ring were actually men who were in love with her, and she would go to them and say, Spy for me, and you know, risk your life for me, and, and they would do it. And many of them lost. Their and many of them lost their lives as a result. Yeah. Let's go back to Lawrence, and and let's talk a little bit about uh, process. Um, this book is as good an example as I know, and one of the best examples I know, of the way biography uh, humanizes history and uh, and allows uh, the story to be made personal, because so many books about World War I, or any, they're about troop movements. Right. They're about national goals. And if this book makes anything clear, it's that there are actual individual people responsible for this mess. That's right. And by using all the biographical techniques at, at your disposal, which are considerable, you, you give a sense of, of what was, what might have been, what didn't happen, what should have happened, that you just don't find in any of the standard histories of the period. And I think I was aided in that because of the region I was covering. I, I don't, you know, I think if you look, say, at the Western Front or the Eastern Front of World War I, 
it, what, it is the history of, of movements, or, or the people who, who made the history were generals, or, or prime ministers, or, or kings. It, that's the amazing thing about the Middle East, is during this time period, it literally was this handful of, of men, and at, I mean, at the time, it, it was virtually all men, um, who just through the force of their own personality, their talent for treachery, um, and cunning, it really did it really did change history. And but one of the things you point out about Lawrence is that he's a genius at not pretending not to see. Uh, oh, telegrams! Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> papers that are sent to him yeah. and urgent memos, which he deliberately doesn't see for two days, while he does the opposite of what he's being ordered to That's do. That's right. He would do that again and again. It, it's it's uh, you know because the t the tele telegraph and the wireless were quite recent inventions. So whenever. Now, Lawrence is off in Arabia, and, and uh, there, Cairo was sending him messages of what, you know, what orders, not messages, orders of what he should do. And he would, if, if he didn't agree with him, he'd just send, send a message back saying, garbled in transmission. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he did it again and again. And he was brilliant. He was, he was, a, he was this brilliant bureaucrat. Among his talents was this incredible skill at bureaucratic infighting. And, and he knew where all the little power blocks were within the British military and political structure, and he used the communications of the day. He would, he, you know, he would, he, a message would come in that from from somebody he didn't agree with. He would he would he would say I didn't get it or is garbled. Um, he would shoot off a message to somebody he perceived as an ally to marginalize a, a third person, and then cover his tracks so that that person would never trace it back to him. He was he was he was a brilliant. Uh, Bureaucratic infighter, and and uh, you know it's not very sexy, but in fact, so much of his, what he was able to achieve was by snaking his way through the the, the British bureaucracy, and by what you call him out as treason. Right. right. Uh, let's talk about that. The yeah. the uh, Sykes Pico Agreement. Right. What had happened was in 1915, in the autumn of 1915. The, the war was not going at all well for the, for the British. Um, they cut a deal with King Hussein of the Hejaz, of, of Western Arabia, um, and basically said, um, if you rise up in revolt, if, you're, if your followers would rise up in revolt against the Turks, we will give the Arabs sweeping Independence for all, for all, virtually all of the Middle East, you know, at the end of the war, and it's called that was called the Hussein, the King Hussein McMahon, who was the chief, kind of a governor general of Egypt, the, the, the Hussein McMahon correspondence. The British then turn around the three months later and cut a deal with the French, where they, without ever telling the French about the deal they had just cut with King Hussein, basically carving up the region between themselves. So. Lawrence, at this point, is in the, is in the military intelligence office in um, Cairo. He knows about both of these agreements. So when he goes to Arabia, when the Arab Revolt starts, and he allies himself with Faisal, um, King Hussein's son, who is the main Arab uh, leader fighting in the field, he's only, Arab, uh, Lawrence is only there for a few months. And he takes Faisal aside and tells him about the existence of Sykes-Picot. There's only maybe 50 people in the world who know about Sykes-Picot. It's a, this top secret diplomatic accord agreement. Um, and he tells them, and, he, and the reason he tells them is that he basically says, do not trust the promises my government has made to you. If you want independence, if the Arabs want independence, they're gonna have to fight for it. They're not only gonna have to fight against the Turks, but they're gonna have to fight against the British and the French. He went to he calls the French, that's the real enemy. That, right, that's right. That's the, the, the French are the real enemy. And the interesting thing is with, with the, so many of the biographies that have been done on Lawrence over the years, um, primarily written by, by uh, British writers, this, this, this whole, this, this act of treason, it, I mean, as treason goes, the, you know, t telling a third party about the existence of a secret treaty in wartime, it, it, you don't get much more treasonous than that. But the way most British historians, especially if they lionize Lawrence, the way they explain it, it's like, yes, okay, yeah, maybe technically he committed treason, but he was only doing it to screw over the French, you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's basically, so, you know, in the British mindset, yeah, okay, treason, but not something to be deplored, actually be admired, you know. <laughs> 
Um, but in fact, he wasn't. It, the, I mean, he may have said that the main enemy is the French, um, but the real player in the region was the British. And Lawrence was very aware of that, and he was very aware that what he was doing was trying to subvert the imperial designs of his own government. And it escalated from there. Um, the amazing thing of, of people who've seen the movie that, and, and really Lawrence's greatest military triumph was taking Aqaba. And the, way, the, the reason it's such an amazing um, feat, um, still studied at West Point actually, um, is that rather than attack by, by sea, it's, it was the last and very strategic uh, Turkish held uh, port on the Red Sea. Um, on a tiny, tiny channel. little inlet, yeah, and surrounded by mountains right behind. So there was no problem taking Aqaba. The, the problem was ever, it was, you were going to be pinned down by these mountains that rise up right behind it. And that was where the Turks um, had their blockhouses and trenches. And it would have been a, it would have been a repeat of Gallipoli. If, if, um, so what Lawrence did was he, he came up with the idea of going out into the desert. And so, so instead of 200 miles up the coast, he went 600 miles across the desert to come over the mountains from behind and to, to basically to attack the Turks from behind. But he, he, never told, he never told any British officer, colleague, that he was doing it. And, and he set off into the desert with 45 Arab rebels. And it, it took him two months to, and recruiting more people as time went on, so that they ended up about 600 men uh, captured Aqaba. But the reason he did it was because the British and the French had this idea that if they took Aqaba, then they could, and again, it's, it's easier if you see a map, but then they could actually bottle up the Arab revolt to Arabia. They could, they, could, they could keep it from spreading into Syria, which the French and the British wanted to divide up amongst themselves. So, a lot, so yes, the, Arabs were, the Arab rebels were their allies, but they wanted the allies to just, just to stay back in the sandlot and not get into the, the, the places that were coveted by the British and the French. Lawrence knew this, so his taking of Aqaba was not just a military feat, but it was a political one, and he was doing it to subvert his own government. Um, and that's something that kind of gets lost when, it, it, it's very interesting of, of, of again, most, most biographers of, of Lawrence have been British. And so, and so they, they do a lot of this dancing around of, of the fact that really he was operating against the, his own government. Right. The, the movie, the first two hours of the first half before the intermission is basically about the campaign to, to Aqaba. Right. Um, and two events that everybody who's seen the movie remembers is the, uh, the, guy, the, the uh, riderless camel that Lawrence insanely goes back into the desert to find Gassim, I think. Gassim, yeah. And then the, uh, the man in the movie, Gassim is also the guy that Lawrence has to execute. Right. Now, you have both of these sequences, but they're two different men. Two different things. They, it was two different things. He, um, he, uh, the man he executed, he was, he was going on this long trek through the, through the mountains and he, with 12 people, uh, 12 rebels, um, basically as, as kind of as uh, bodyguards, more or less. And a, a few developed, and uh, one, one of the people in his party was killed, and it was discovered to be this, another member of the party. And because Lawrence was now, he was, Lawrence really understood the f blood feuds and vendettas and, and what was going to happen because the, these were men from two different tribes, the, the killer and, the, and the, the man he had murdered, was that once they got to the main Arab camp, there was now going to be a blood feud between the two tribes. And um, so the murder, murderer had to be executed and the only person to do it was Lawrence because he was the only outsider. If, if, if the dead man's own tribesmen had done it, then, then now, you've got a, now you've got a blood feud. So he led this man uh, into a goalie, let him say a last prayer, and, and shot him. Um, and as in the film, several times, several he kept, times. his hand must have been shaking because he keeps... Shot him, he had to shoot him three times yeah. Yeah, before he killed him. And as you, as you say, it's the first man he killed. It was the first man he killed. He, yeah, he many had, more to... Many more to come. Many more to come, yeah. Um, one of the things I love about the book, it's the only book I've ever read uh, about Lawrence in which you don't seem to have a dog in the fight. You just take Lawrence whole, which is what makes great biography. Um, and then we can decide where we want to stand. I'm amazed. Um, you, you talked about the, the British biographers who want to defend him. But I'm amazed at how many World War I history, histories 
try to write him out of the picture altogether. Right. Uh, even uh, David Frumkin's uh, The Peace yeah. to End Peace, he says, well, uh, Aqaba was probably Lawrence's idea, but it was really uh, out as out of uh, Abu, Abu Tayyip. Tayyip. Yeah. He's the guy who really did. Right. Yeah, I, I think there's a whole political agenda that comes with trying, well, both to minimize, they, they go hand in hand. One is to minimize the Arab revolt, the importance of the Arab revolt. Um, and I think that that's done because th there's all this moral uneasiness historically among the British, very aware that they had made promises to the Arabs that they then betrayed. And so if you can kind of minimize the importance of the Arab revolt, then you, then you minimize the betrayal. And of course, if, you, if you're trying to minimize the importance of the Arab revolt, by extension, you, you, you minimize Lawrence. I think there was also this, it's funny, the, the first really scorching, very hostile biography of Lawrence was done in the 1950s, 1953, I believe, by, by a guy named Aldington, who had been a, um, he had served on, on the, on the uh, Western Front and had, had been horribly wounded twice, and I, I believe he had, had suffered poison gas. Um, and I think that there was this sense of, you know, here's this matinee idol. If you, once Lawrence wrote Seven Pillars of Wisdom, and Lowell Thomas had his, his, his travel show that about, about Lawrence. Here's this guy who's become this matinee idol where, you know, and he's prancing around the desert in Arab robes, and, you know, while I, I just spent four years in the mud, um, Seeing, seeing, my, seeing my comrades you know, dying one after the other. So I think, there, I think, among, I think probably the anti-Lawrence thing started among World War I veterans mm -hmm. who had served on the Western Front. Because, you know, I mean, what a ghastly experience that was. And there was nothing romantic about it. No, there was no matinee idol you could, you could create out of the Western Front. Well, and, and one would have thought Lawrence, who's what, 5'4", rather a homely guy, not Peter O'Toole. No. Uh. <laughs> a foot difference. I, Peter O'Toole is six foot three, and and Lawrence charitably. It, it's it's funny. But what, I, I I just got a kind of angry email from from a from a, a, a Lawrence biographer saying you know he wasn't. I I think I said he was either five foot three or five foot four. And he said he was five foot five and a quarter. You know. <laughs> 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 but yeah, no, yeah, it's a big difference. So. Um. Um. Let's go back to Aqaba for a second, because one of the things that's, it, oh, but first let me say, those of you who are, read source notes will be well rewarded by the source notes, mm -hmm. because you do take a number of highly regarded historians, including Frankin, to task mostly in the, you explain why you have the view you have and why you disagree, and they're very right. pot, uh, potent arguments, I think. Right. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll give you, you know, it's, it's my experience. It, it was just such a, such a, such a kind of a, a classic exercise in, in realizing why you always have to go back to, to primary sources. And if you don't, then, and especially when you're dealing with something like the Middle East, which is, is such a contentious history, you're, you're just repeating, potentially, the, the distortions and at times outright lies of, of, of the historians that have come before you. I, I'll, I'll just give it, I, I hope this doesn't get too obscure, I, I, but a great example of this was at one point, Lawrence, this was after Aqaba, and he was going off to, to blow up this bridge. It was virtually a suicide mission, um, and everybody expected Lawrence to be killed in this mission. And for the first part of the trip, he was accompanied by another British officer, um, a, a, a guy named uh, George Lloyd, and the night before they were going to part, Lloyd was going to go back and Lawrence was going to go on. Uh, they had this conversation and Lawrence, in the, from the authorized biography on for the, you know, in every book where they talk about this conversation in, of, of the last 30 years, any book, um, they have Lloyd's note saying, you know, Lawrence, Lawrence recognizes that he probably won't come back. Lawrence says he's no longer he, he no, he's no longer fighting for the allies, um, but for the Arabs. Now, again, allies is, it, when British talk about allies, it's code for the French, uh, you know, and so basically he's saying- But it's America's like, not in the war. Yet. Right, America's not in the war. Um, but so this, this, this quote of Lloyd's of, 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 you know, taking notes from, uh, you know, 
at the same time that he was talking with Lawrence. This has just been repeated endlessly. So I went back to the original source, and he didn't say allies at all. He's, the, uh, the, the allies is not the word. It, it, what he wrote, what Lloyd wrote of his conversation was HMG, which means His Majesty's Government. So what Lawrence was really saying is, I'm not fighting anymore for the British crown. I'm fighting for the Arabs. Mm -hmm. So it seems, I mean, it's not a small thing. It's a very, it's a very big thing. I mean, Lawrence had gone native, and he, he, was, he was out there. So it, it wasn't, and it's just amazing that once the first historian, and this guy is actually very highly regarded, um, once he, we'll say, mistran <laughs> you know, Mist, uh, transpose the word or, so, or something. Um, everybody has repeated it. It's taken it up from yeah. one book to another yeah. until it be and Well, you have a, a moment here that I, I thought is a perfect definition of the biographer's dilemma as played out in, in life here. Lawrence tells his superiors that the Syrians venerate Faisal, and you say, as with everything else, Lawrence said in Cairo, and this is a quote, his superiors had little way of either confirming or refuting this assertion. It simply became part of the narrative of what lay in store once the battle for Syria was joined. Right. Then he later said, we must reduce impolitic truth, this is Lawrence speaking, we must reduce impolitic truth to keep Britain confident and ourselves a legend. The crowd <laughs> wanted book heroes, and then you write, like any good performer, Lawrence gave the crowd what they wanted. Right. So he's, they're all doing this. Sykes is doing this, Aronson and Weitzman, they're all inventing stories that are passed like a game of telephone. Right. Slightly right. altered, but they become the narrative that, to which millions of lives are ultimately sacrificed. That's right, that's right. And it happens again and again, you know, just to mention Gallipoli, that the, the British had such utter contempt for the Turks as soldiers, and I, I, there was a handbook that I, I came across where, um, you know, this is an official handbook handed out to British officers being sent to, to, the, to the Middle East. And um, I, I'm paraphrasing slightly, I can't remember the exact quote, but it basically said, you know, the, the, the average Turkish soldier is, is dim-witted and slow and is unlikely to fight unless his back is to the wall. So this was their whole, when they went ashore in Gallipoli, this is what they were expecting. And they just thought, Kind of reminds the you know <laughs> the Americans going into Iraq, um, you know they just, they just thought that they, they were going to roll over and um, and and just walk in, and and what is amazing at Gallipoli, I mean talk about how you know the effect of, on human lives. The day that Gallipoli started, the British rowed ashore in wooden boats onto the beaches, um, in these little picket boats, 60, 70 men in these boats, all with 80 pound packs on. And the Tur there was one company of Turkish troops were on the shore with machine guns, and they killed 4,000 British soldiers in, in, in a morning. Um, you know, the, 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 the insanity that, just the, the utter hubris and contempt for the enemy that, that you would send men ashore in wooden boats, you know, rowing. Well, one of the things <laughs> that keeps happening is the, the, what you call the frontal assault, right. which never works. Right. And they just keep marching into the gunfire. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I mean, which is one thing. of the, I suppose, another reason why Aqaba is so significant. Right, right. Uh, sticking with Aqaba for a second, I'm very interested in the way you dramatize the story, the way you jump back and forth, and, and uh, it, it's just an incredible thing because it, you have a sense of these, this vast territory in which these individuals are jumping right and left, occasionally uh, they run into each other right. long enough to exchange a few lies and then bound off, and half the time, they don't even know who they, I mean, Lawrence doesn't really remember Aronson. Right. Nobody really knows what the other guy is doing. The first, you start the book with Lawrence uh, hearing about these American playboys, yeah. and he goes to their tent and basically talks them out of whatever information they have. That's right, and that's William Yale. The, the, it's, it's this, it, it's, it, I opened the book with this, it was a year before the war started, it was 1913. And uh, Lawrence was, he was an archaeologist, but the British, he was on a covert mission for, for, the, for the British Army the, under, under the guise of, of exploring the Negev Desert, present-day southern, southern Israel, uh, for looking for archaeological ruins. In fact, they, they were militarily mapping the whole region for the, for the British military. So Lawrence is on a secret mission in the region, and then William Yale and his two companions it, and back then, Playboys meant sort of rich, 
men of leisure. And so they're going, so they're pretending to be on this tour of the Holy Land sites. Um, and they have this- Tourists. Just, tourists, they're essentially tourists. They're biblical tourists. And, and yet, under the guise of that, they're sneaking away and, and, and prospecting for oil and, and taking, you know, doing drillings and stuff. So these two groups, both of whom are lying, both, both of whom have this cover story, meet in the desert. And, uh, and it's, this, it's this great scene. It was the first time Lawrence and Yale met. And years later, uh, Yale wrote a memoir. It was never published, an unpublished memoir that I, I found at Boston University. And, uh, and he realized that, that Lawrence, in fact, knew all along that uh, you know, he knew they were really oil men. So right through the yeah. disguise. Yeah. Uh, again, dramatizing the story. My favorite scene, I think, in the, in the film is uh, uh, right after Aqaba, where uh, Lawrence and one of the uh, young scamps that he sort of adopts, uh, they go into Cairo. And of course, they're treated as wargs, right. practically spat on. And then uh, Alan B. comes down and basically confirms what Lawrence has achieved. And then suddenly, the Maurice Jarre music starts building, <laughs> and everybody starts applauding him. And then there's a dramatic cut to Alan B. and the Claude Rains uh, composite politician character walking in an exterior corridor their footsteps amplified on the soundtrack, right. and uh, Alan B. <laughs> says, uh, well, he's riding the whirlwind, and Floyd Rain says, well, let's hope we're not, right. and then it, intermission. And this is how you do it. Um, you, you, end, you, you take us through the Yakaba campaign, which is fascinating, breaking it up occasionally to tell us where the other characters are at the time, and then it turns out that once they're there, it's really an anticlimax. It's right. a bloodless, uh, the, the Turks have no idea what's going on. They basically take over and, and there's no big deal. Then you do a dramatic cut, not <laughs> only a, a dropped line or even a new chapter, but you cut to the third section of the book. Right. And Lawrence goes to see the Brigadier General is in charge of British intelligence, whose name I'm blanking. Um, Clayton. Clayton. Gilbert Clayton. Gilbert yep. Clayton. And Clayton sees him in the filthy uh, robes and starts to kick him out. And then he sees the blue eyes. Right. He realizes it's Lawrence. And uh, he has just sent a cable to London saying nothing's going on. Things are as bad as ever. It's very boring. And now Lawrence tells him what he's just done. And then he adds an addendum to right. his cable in which he says that he has very few details because Lawrence, quote, is somewhat exhausted by 1,300 miles on a camel in the last 30 days. Yeah. And then he adds what I thought is a rather spine-tingling cinematic observation. I mean, this is the kind of thing that you can only do as a, as a historian writing. <laughs> you can't translate this into a movie. He says, I think, however, that you will be interested in the above brief sketch of a very remarkable performance calling for a display of courage, resource, and endurance, which is conspicuous even in these days when gallant deeds are of daily occurrence. And then you realize that is when the whole legend right. is born. That's right. Because before that, nobody ever gave Lawrence the time of day. That's right. That's and right. then you do a flashback to how the really fascinating trip that he had to make from Aqaba to Cairo. But I think it's a, it's a very interesting, if you compare the two, th it's two very different uh, mediums. Right, yeah, right, and of course in movies you, you, you have to do composite characters and you, you have to compress. And um, I mean, I, I do think that movie is, is I, I mean, I think it's the greatest biopic that's ever been made. And, um, I, I, and you know, again, I, I think it gets something of Lawrence's essence. Well, it, it's it's odd. While getting almost all the factual details wrong, it somehow arrives at a, at a, at a greater truth. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. The the other, uh, for example, we were just talking about Gassim uh, in the movie. He brings he, he brings him back, and he's a great hero. Right. And as you point out, they actually were full of contempt that he would do something that right. moronic. That, that's right. When the guy got lost in the desert, yeah, and he went back. Yeah, it, I mean, it was, and, and given the, the code of the desert, 
you know, the, the man, apparently the man stopped to relieve himself and wasn't holding on to his camel, so the camel wandered off and he's lost. And he's lost in a part of the desert where you have about two hours before you die. Um, and Lawrence went back to look for this guy. And so the, with the rest of his, uh, his group, it's like, what are you thinking? You know, he brought his death on himself for being stupid. And you're stupid for risking your life for one that has now been proven to be worthless. Uh, you know, it's a very harsh code. Um, so yeah, and, and, and Lawrence talked about that. They, they, they berated him for going back. You know, it wasn't this moment where it's, it, that he's embraced as a son of the desert, just the opposite. What have you primarily to go on in drawing the portrait of Lawrence? There's seven pillars of wisdom, of course, which you use a lot, but also point out that there are all kinds right. of uh, factual problems. There are the letters, which are amazing. Right. I, I, the letter that he sends to his mother after oh. his brother is killed. I've never read anything like that. Which he basically berates her for mourning. Right. No, it's astonishing. And, and you know, the amazing thing is the British save everything, especially anything with paper. You know, they're just they're pack rats <laughs> when it comes to paper. So all this stuff is preserved. And and the letter he the, the letter he wrote, it was a, actually a, a telegram he sent his his parents. And back then it's basically almost the size of a postcard, and it's folded in two. It's like when you were sending a telegram, you would write on this thing and hand it across to the person to send. And it's at the Bodleian Museum in Oxford. And uh, you know, I was able to, to hold the, the original telegram that Lawrence sent. Um, and w to actually see it, it I mean, it's, it's, it's incredibly cold. But basically, this, his, his younger brother has just been killed on the Western Front. Um, and this note, and again, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but he, he says, um, you know, I've waited, to, I've waited to write now because I was waiting for more details. He'd heard about his brother being killed two weeks earlier. And for two weeks, he hadn't even bothered to send a message to his parents. And he said, and, you know, and I got father's letter yesterday, and it makes for very pleasant reading. And, you know, um, Frank died in a very good way, and surely there's no reason to go into mourning for him. Uh, and then he didn't even say love. He, uh, he was known as Ned in the family. It's just signed N. No love, no, and that's it. And and when you look at the original, you realize this, this guy wrote this in forty seconds. You know that he this was not. I mean, it was just something he he jotted off the top of his head. Mm -hmm. And um, and then a, apparently another message came back from his mother, berating him for not comforting her in his in her hour of grief. And then he wrote an even nastier letter back to her after that. Um, so. Um, yeah, that's fascinating. But, it, but it, it, it's, an, it's, another I mean, it's another reason to go back to the original stuff, because it, often when you, see, when you see the original document, certain things are, are just become very obvious to you. And um, so, so a, a lot of what I did, I spent months in the, in the National Archives in, in London. And the, it's an incredible place, because literally, you, without wearing gloves or anything, you go through these great volumes and you come across a handwritten note by Lawrence or by Churchill or by Allenby. Um, and so that's, you know, I mean, that was kind of the backbone of, of a lot of my, a lot of my research is that. And then after the massacres that he generates, participates in, there's one scene where there are, I think, 500 Turkish prisoners that have been. Yeah, but, yeah but I think 250 or something, or 350 but 250, yeah. yes, I think that's the number. And uh, he just turns a machine gun. Mm -hmm. This is a it, and this is a, a classic example of of the of the way biography can be whitewashed and everything. There 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 will be you can pick up tons of different Lawrence biographies where that doesn't even appear. And and there are also some where they say, well, no, Lawrence never ordered prisoners to be executed. Um, Never mind that it's both in his memoir <laughs> that he did. In, it's in, in seven In the pillars. kind of detail that you, at one point you talk about is violence porn. Yeah, yeah, um, and it's and it was he talked about it in his official battle report that he sent to Cairo, and and it's right there. And he he said um, he said that he came, he had ordered at the beginning of this battle he had he had given word that no quarter that no prisoners should be taken, and this afternoon. As he was circling back, he'd come across this unit that hadn't gotten the no quarter command and had taken these 250 Turkish and German prisoners. And the prisoners are just sitting on the side of the road, all disarmed. And um, in Lawrence's official report, he went to Cairo. He says, um, um, uh, I, I turned the Hotchkiss on them, the Hotchkiss being a machine gun, 
and, uh, and made an end of them. Um, and it was also, he says, I've, I think uh, in his orders to, I forget who, one of the, maybe Faisal, that uh, he will do best who brings me the most dead yeah. Turks. Yeah. Yeah, and it, towards the end of the war, Lawrence was was clearly becoming unhinged. In that that massacre, it was, and it, that was certainly the most most horrific thing he he did. It was at the right at the it was, I think it was September twenty eighth of nineteen eighteen. A month later, October thirtieth of nineteen eighteen, he's led into Buckingham Palace to be knighted by the king, and um, and this the. the this, he, he comes in, and at this point, the, the, the king has given so many knighthoods and medals to the British soldiers after four years of war that they're almost always done en masse. Um, and, uh, and this was a private investiture, right. and the queen was there. The queen almost always, she hardly ever went to these things. Um, but she had heard about Lawrence and his, his exploits and everything, so she came. And uh, so the king is going to put the first medal on Lawrence's chest, and he says, I refuse. And... Um, which you would think he could have called. <laughs> right, right. He, yeah, yeah what, why wait until he's just about it? <laughs> and uh, you know, in, the, in the, Br the British monarchy, there is a protocol for everything. But there was no protocol for somebody who refuses a knighthood because I was, never, I, I, I was not able to find any record that it had ever happened before in 900 years of British history. Um, and so the king just kind of stands there for a minute and then ends up putting putting the medal back on the Lord Chamberlain's pillow that he's holding, <laughs> and Lawrence turns and walks out of the room. And so these, these two events separated by almost exactly a month, you know, um, it's kind of amazing. You know. Everybody seems to agree that this, whatever happened to him in Dara yeah. is, is one of the things that changed him, and we don't really know exactly. I mean, you, you offered the several different versions, including Lawrence's, which goes on for pages. Right. Uh, in which he's tortured in ways that are not only unimaginable but impossible. Right, right. Yeah, this, the, he, was, uh, he was taken prisoner by the Turks. They, they clearly didn't recognize him. He had a bounty on his head at that point. And the, the, what, the one way you can, you can get around the Ottoman world, he, he, Lawrence had piercing blue eyes. But there's a, this tribe called the Circassians, which is up near the Black Sea, um, which was part of, part of the Ottoman Empire at the time. So this, this came up again and again, where Lawrence could pass himself off as a, he, as a Circassian. So when he was captured, he claimed to be a Circassian. Um, was the, the governor of the town wanted to rape him? Um, in Seven Pillars, Lawrence describes, as you said, this horrific, horrific torture that goes on for five pages. Um, and then at that point, he's, he's, so, he's such a pitiful, I think he says he's, he was such a pitiful creature at that point that the bay, the, the governor, didn't want to have anything to do with me, so they threw him in a shed. And then it becomes this kind of, uh, kind of a cartoon. Es he Lawrence escapes through escape, a window. Goes through a window. There happens to be Arab robes in, in the shed that he's in. He puts in the Arab robes. He climbs out a window. He walks out of the town, he, and then he gets on a camel and rides for 50 miles. Um, physically impossible. And then he told another version to a friend about a year later in a letter. Um, which also was utterly implausible. But then he developed a friendship with uh, George Bernard Shaw's wife after the war, Charlotte Shaw, and where he talked very euphemistically about, he, he says, you know, I lost my integrity in Dara, and it will haunt me forever. Well, he's my, my bodily integrity. My bodily integrity, right. yeah. And so I, in, 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 it's the one place in the book where I, I conjecture some because it's such an, I think it's such an important event to understand Lawrence. Um, I suspect what happened was that he, they started to torture him and at a certain, and, and Lawrence was a man, he was, I mean, he was almost a, almost a masochist. I mean, his, he would do these things to test how long, you know, he had this iron will to test his endurance and push himself to the to extreme. Um, and I think that probably he submitted. I mean, I think at one point the torture just got so bad that he, he surrendered to being raped. Um, and I, th that's the only kind, of, that's the only scenario that really kind of makes sense to me. And, and I think it haunted him forever after. And, and in, probably not coincidentally, at the end of a year later, the massacre I was talking about, the machine gunning of the prisoners, 
it was all in the same, he had come back to the same town. It was right outside of Dera, where, where his worst atrocities occurred um, at the end of the war. I'll take a couple of questions if you want to line up. There's two microphones on each side. Um, by the summer of 1918, uh, it looks like the central powers are going to win the war. The Soviet, right. the Russians are out. Russians are gone. With their revolution, America's not yet in or it's, isn't doing anything. They're in, but they're, the Doughboys haven't arrived. They don't know how to, right. where to disperse them. Germany is moving forward. And then it all falls apart. Later. Yeah. And you, you more than imply that Damascus is a turning point. It, that's, it was, because it, it was, you know, it, I mean, the amazing thing that happened in World War I was that once it started to fall apart, and it, it was, people had been predicting this since 1914, and it, it was increasingly implausible, but both sides thought, you know, once you start knocking out the supports of the other side, the whole thing is going to come tumbling down. They're, they're going to reach, a, they're going to just reach a point of collapse. And it, it happened in Germany. Yes, it, by, it, you know, if you looked at, at March of 1918, you would absolutely think that the, the Germans were about to win the war uh, after this four years of trench warfare and utter paralysis. Um, and instead, they, they made this one last offensive. And, and, um, and the, the counteroffensive, the Allied counteroffensive, started in Syria. It started with Allenby's army and, and started with, the, and the Turkish army just imploded in Palestine, the whole area just, collapsed within three days. And that rot then, it, it, it spread to the Austro-Hungarians, to the Bulgarians, to, to the Germans. And just very, very quickly, uh, the, whole thing, the whole thing went. Between September, I, I, I think the, the, the campaign in, September 17th is the date that sticks out in my mind, it was, it was when, the, um, when Allenby's offensive started, September 18th. And by, by the, November, the beginning of November, the whole thing was over everywhere. November 11th was Armistice Day when, the, when Germany finally gave up. Uh, so yeah, the whole thing in two months. Start there. Um, Lawrence was, I guess, kind of a hero of mine uh, uh, many years ago. In fact, I ended up getting stuck in the Sahara uh, <laughs> based, uh, you know, after I read his book, you know, Seven Pillars of Wisdom. I was wondering if you might want to does Lawrence have anything to teach us today in the, you know, the 21st century in the terms of the things that he uh, valued, the things that he set on high, the, the challenges he set for himself uh, in our world where almost like everything we value is almost like the opposite, like uh, we value comfort above everything, convenience. And he went over, overboard to go the other direction. I wonder if you might have any... What's yeah, uh, uh, well, I think maybe two things. One, one kind of a political answer, but more, more personal. It, it, Lawrence was a real ascetic. He, uh, he, he was incredibly Spartan. After the war, he was, he, he, he could have been, he could have been a multimillionaire, um, and and yet seven, he refused to let Seven Pillars of Wisdom be be uh, published beyond a 200 print run, and then any royalties from that he he gave to a RAF charity. He lived in a tiny uh, little cottage down in, in Dorset. Uh, he worked as a private for how many? He re-enlisted re in the military as a private, and he insisted on being a private. He, he, he had, in 1918, he was a lieutenant colonel, and so he, he, he and, and again, oh, he was a he hero. He could have he he could have come in at any level he wanted. He insisted on going back in as a private. So I, I think there was this. El, el, element of, of self-abnegation about him and, and, uh, and rather, rather tor I, think, I think he was a very tortured figure after the war. On a political level, what Lawrence said all along about the Middle East was that he saw, in a way he was a British patriot because he foresaw that if the British tried to colonize in, in this area the way they'd done in Africa and uh, in Asia, that it was going to come to grief. And what he understood probably better than anybody, he understood the, the way the clans and the tribes and the Arab society worked. And in that way, um, it, you know, it's, it, he, he once wrote this, the, this thing called 20, 27 articles, and there's 27 uh, tips for, for British officers that really he was writing for at the time of understanding Arab society. 
And the, the interesting thing is Petraeus, when he was in Iraq, he finally came across the 27 Articles, I think it was in 2006, 2007, and made it mandatory reading of, for American officers in Iraq. Even though it was um, for different... It was, yeah, for, yeah. Different <laughs> tribes. Right, he, he was saying, Lawrence said this is specifically for Bedouins, not for, not for uh, town Arabs. Um, but but I, I think that, you know, people have asked me if Lawrence came back and saw the Middle East today, what would he say? And, and I, I think the obvious answer is he would have said, I told you so. Um, <laughs> he, he foresaw the, the, the disaster that was coming. And so he felt even for, even for British self-interest that they should live up to the promises of, uh, that they'd made the, the, to the Arabs. Hi, this may take you far away from primary sources, but uh, quite a few years ago I came across what seemed to be a sort of sympathetic uh, psychobiography by a psychologist, John Mack, and I think it was called Prince of Our Disorder. Right. Uh, I wonder what you thought about that. Yeah, uh, you know, he, he, uh, Prince of Our Disorder, it was, it's a psychological biography of Lawrence, and, and a really fascinating book. He actually won the Pulitzer Prize for that book. Um, and. Uh, I think I, I think it's a terrific book. I think it's probably one of the one of the better books, if not the best book, done on Lawrence. Well, I I really enjoyed the book. It was a fascinating read, and uh, every page. I'm in awe of what you've done. That said, <laughs> I was struck by the fact you either didn't mention at all or barely mentioned Gertrude Bell a person whose admirers think she was a more prodigious camel rider, more prodigious linguist, more important nation builder, and her path crossed Lawrence's uh, several times. Right. How come she's not in the book? Well, uh, Gertrude Bell, if it, I've, I've, I've gotten asked this question a few times. Gertrude Bell was uh, yeah, a fantastic figure, but she, was, she spent almost the entire war in Iraq, where, uh, in Mesopotamia. She only was in the Arab Bureau in Cairo for about four months. She was one of many people who, who's, who uh, rotated in out of Cairo. Um, she and Lawrence had met briefly prior to the war. Um, I believe they met once in Cairo during the war. She was really important in 1920 at the Cairo conference where she and Lawrence worked together um, to, to basically try to, to erase certain lines, imperial lines, and, and, and draw new ones, and, and give more independence to the, to the Arabs. But, but I, 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 I cover the, the Cairo conference in a couple of paragraphs in the, in the epilogue. And so I, I, they had very little interaction during the war, which is the, the, the bulk of my, my book. And so I felt that she, there was, and, what, and, and I talk about the Cairo conference so briefly, it, it seemed odd to bring in another character at that point. But, it, you know, there have been a couple of great biographies uh, uh, done on Bell, um, and I have to say, that prior to the books coming out, she was not a well-known figure. And I think that, I, I know one book in particular of, of, the, of the two biographies, they really made a point of kind of playing up any Lawrence connection that existed because, and I've seen other books do this with, with even more sort of uh, obscure figures in there, to, to kind of attach their name to a more famous person. Is that but if, if you had to weigh in your own mind who was a more important figure in the Middle East, would you say Lawrence was or Bell was, or you can't make that judgment one way or the other? Um, I, I, I would say I would say Lawrence. I would say Lawrence was more. I mean, Gertrude Bell was was very important, but again, she was almost exclusively in Iraq, right? And she saw disaster coming in Iraq, and and sure enough, disaster did come to to the British in Iraq. Um, but I think because Lawrence moved around so much, and because he had a battlefield role. Um, I, I, you know, again, because Gertrude Bell was a woman, she was, she was mainly stuck in Basra and, uh, for, for most of the war. Um, but yeah, she did, did incredible, incredible trips prior to the war and, and had really explored huge, huge regions in Arabia. Since I'm here, can I hog and ask a, an unrelated question? Sure. It occurred to me, I was amazed at how much happened because nobody knew where the hell anybody was out in the desert. In, in the era of drones and satellites and the like, that could not possibly happen today, right? Well, that's, that's true, yeah, yeah. The, the, the idiocy can still happen today. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the number uh, 500 that I had in my head before I just remembered, there's a, there's a marvelous moment where Jamal Pasha, the Syrian governor, is being asked to release 500 Americans who have been sort of 
oh, right. uh, isolated there, that right. safe passage. Yeah. And Jamal, and this would not happen now, Jamal says, I'll let them go if they give me their word of honor that they won't talk about anything in the Ottoman Empire until after the war. That's right. That's right. It, 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 they can't, it's, it, yeah, that's right. If, if, they, if they promise not to, to see, you know, say any military installations they've seen and, and stuff, that, uh, then they can go. And so, of course, the, Ameri the American uh, uh, ambassador. Well, if you put that in a novel. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, all over. It, yeah. right. Well, the other amazing, the, um, the, prior to the war, the, the, the chief advisor to the Ottoman Navy was a British admiral. And so he'd been actually on the payroll of the Ottoman government, and he, he, he built the coastal defenses in the Dardanelles, which is where Gallipoli was, and, he, if he didn't, and if he didn't actually build them, he knew where they all were because he had toured them, and he, he had put the artillery in. And so then when the war starts, this admiral, he's, Jamal Pasha gives him a, a royal send-off because they're, they're friends, but he goes back to Britain. Britain deliberately sits him in Malta because, and never consults him, even before like going ashore in Gallipoli, because it's just not proper. It's not proper that, you know, he knows, he has this information, but he got this information when he was on the payroll of the Turkish government. And so it's just, it's just not right that we should ask him what he knows. Just phenomenal, you know. Um. <laughs> Last question, do you have another book in mind? I'm, I'm, I'm playing around with a couple of different ideas. I, I, this, this book was so intensive, especially the last year, and I, and I, I really only f did the final, final galleys, I think, in, in early June. That I mean, what I'm finding is I'll, I, I'm, I'm in a bit of a state where I'll, I'll get an idea and I'll, I'll be very enthused by it for a couple of days, <laughs> and then and all of a sudden I'll think, no, what, you, what am I thinking? So uh, um, I, I think I'm going to give it a little weight. I, I owe the New York Times Magazine a couple of articles, and so I think I'm going to go off and do those. And, uh, well, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you.